Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is your host, Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac. And right now you're listening to the group Scro. And Scro features our guest today, which is Christopher Leslegor. He produces the music for the band Scro, and we're going to talk about some of his music production process. So enjoy. Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is your host, Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac. And today I'm having the pleasure to talk to Christopher Leslegord. Uh, yeah. Hi. Good. Awesome. All right. I'm <laughs> practicing nice my Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> and he's from the group called Scro. That's spelled yep. S G R O W. And um, they're an electronic music duo. And uh, I've just recently. Um, been in touch with Christopher and he's sent me an email and I listened to his music really liked it and I I had some questions and was wondering about how he made it and uh you know just the fact that you've even completed an album puts you in this like elite group of producers because <laughs> <laughs> as we all know that it's very easy to get a huge collection of unfinished music <laughs> yeah I have a bunch of those as well <laughs> yeah so how you doing thanks for taking the time Doing good. Thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, I think it's the first time I'm on the podcast. Oh, nice. Congratulations. So that's, uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. It's a good podcast to be on for the first time. <laughs> I'm happy to be the one. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. So you guys just put out an album, huh? Yeah. Just recently. The 10th of uh, November. Mm -hmm. Congrats on that. That's a wonderful achievement. And uh, it's not the first though. No, it's the second one. And we did an EP before that. And then a few singles here and there. Nice. Can you tell us a little bit about the group? Or the duo? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's um, me and my girlfriend, Vilde Nupen, who's a singer and composer and songwriter and also electronic musician. Um, and me, Ableton Live, uh, Live Electronics uh, guy, producer... Also, guitar player, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, we've been actually making music together since, I think, late 2010. That's when we first mm -hmm. uh, made the first song. And then um, we just did a b bunch of experiments, um, just trying lots of stuff out, uh, like a different genre wise and so on. Um, and then we released our first uh, EP in um, 2013. Um, and yeah, just been working on new material and played lots of gigs and uh, yeah, just like having fun with it, I guess. Oh, that's good. <laughs> fun is an important part of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why we do it. So that's pretty cool that you you said you're working with your girlfriend on that. So it's like a nice thing you guys can share together. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, I, I guess it takes a few years before you can really like put words on what it feels like to to share or something like that. But uh, for me, it's been like really really cool. It's um. You know, probably as a fellow uh, producer and music maker, that it's one of the like feels like one of the closest thing um, for us, and like you're kind of like sharing your soul every time you're showing mm -hmm. someone a new track. So to be able to do that with the one you love, it's really special. Yeah, that that is very cool. I like that. 
So do you guys share the um, the duties together? Like is, is one person in charge of, say, the music and another the vocals? Or uh, how does that work with you guys? Yeah, um, that's actually one of the things that I really like in this duo. Um, because usually, or it seems like, a lot of these duos are very like... Um, Either you have a singer who wants their music produced, or you have a producer who wants someone to sing on their tracks. But um, in this duo, even though she is obviously doing all the singing, and I'm an, I am also not uh, writing any of the lyrics, but the actual like composition part of it feels really connected. Um, sometimes she comes with... Um, like a MIDI MIDI file and a audio recording of her singing, um, and then I can do whatever I want with that, or I make something instrumental and give that to her, um, and then after the first like sketch or first idea, I guess, then the other one responds, um, and then the third part we do together. Hmm. Nice. So it's like a true collaboration then. Yeah, it feels like it. Because I think sometimes, um, you know, that can work great when, when it does work, but sometimes it's also um, helpful when there are defined roles, you know, where, um, you know, each person has their own thing. I've found that um, I, maybe the expectations are clearer with the music, but when you have like certain people that you just really connect with musically, it's nice when... Um, you know, you, you can go through all different angles of production and all different techniques and all different approaches in order to come up with your product. Yeah, and also, like, it doesn't uh, feel like we're repeating as much, or at least, like, it, it feels interesting every time because the ideas can come in so many forms. Right, so you, you don't get caught up in, like, uh, certain routines or patterns of working, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, at least we have enough patterns, I guess, so it doesn't feel like we're just doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> right. So that that helps, I suppose. Yeah, and also it's cool to like work a little bit on your own, then the other one can respond to the idea, like you can like present it in a decent way. Um and also like the mixing process, for example. Hmm. Um I'm doing the actual mixing, but then I always like, okay, do a mixing session, do a bounce, put it in Dropbox, really listens to it, and then she can say, oh yeah, really cool, but uh, you know, version five, you've cut out way too much of this nice bass sound, so right. turn that back up. <laughs> so you always have another ear listening for another perspective. Yeah, exactly. So I guess we're kind of filling out uh, <laughs> each other that way. Yeah, and I think that's so helpful because I know when I work on stuff, I get so close to it and I've heard it so many times over and over again where I think I'm hearing it more with my imagination than my ears. <laughs> so it's nice to have somebody else yeah. come in and just say, hey, this is what I'm hearing. This is um, where I think it could use some work. Yeah, I agree. And also it feels, a lot of times it feels like you're doing all these small tweaks all the time. And like every tweak feels a little better when you like A-B test it, but the sum of all those tweaks can get you really off track if you're not careful. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know about that. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> It's definitely been a humbling experience from time to time where I might have an old version of a song and I compare it to the one that I've been tweaking for days and weeks, and then I like the old version better, and it's just like, oh, man, <laughs> I wasted all that time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, <laughs> you think you're doing all this important work, and you realize you're just ruining it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> ah, that's really cool. Are you guys um, working together? or is, I know you mentioned Dropbox. Is it more of like, a, okay, you take it, then I take it, or is it maybe some sort of mixture? Yeah, it's um, usually on the first idea part, then we always work alone. Um, and then when the other person likes the idea or get inspired, then that person does something with it also alone. Um, and then we get together and like talk about how how 
the other one responded and what we think should be the next step and then a little bit working together a little bit working on separate parts and so on hmm. nice so you're really getting like the best of all the different angles yeah i think so um it took a little bit of time to i guess create this uh, good workflow because mm. there's so many pitfalls like uh, taking stuff way too personal I know I'm guilty of that a lot of times before um, and also just um, yeah, just being maybe a little not scared but like not testing everything really good because it sounds a little bit bad that when you're first doing it but then the end result would be nice and so on so yeah, it, I think it took uh, quite some time but now it feels really really good yeah I'm sure that takes some time to work out I mean in any collaboration or group I've been involved in there's always this um, kind of a maybe like beginning period where you're not really sure how things are going to go over with the other people and you have to kind of learn. I must imagine, um, you know, being in, a, in like a romantic relationship with your collaborator, it's very easy for uh, personal things to come into the mix. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you have to try to uh, yeah, just be really um, like a little bit professional about it and mm -hmm. Yeah, and and also just really take the other person serious and not be too caught up in your own ideas or something. Right. I could definitely see myself having trouble with that. <laughs> Maybe uh, not really vibing on a, a a new reiteration of a track because, well, you didn't do the dishes last night. <laughs> like the petty <laughs> arguments could bleed over a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, you have to try to separate a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think that's a big thing when people make music is um, keeping your ego kind of at the door when you come in. It's uh, it's really easy to be um, take things personal and to feel like um, if somebody doesn't like an idea, they're saying they don't like you. They don't like your music. When, um, you know, really it's just one little idea, one little riff or whatever it might be. I think that's yeah, a, a hard thing to deal with. So I'd imagine you get, you guys must have really um, come together and figured that out in a in a really good way. Yeah, and of course it helps um, to work with something someone you can really communicate with from before, and yeah. then you can like be really clear on stuff and like uh, yeah, just talk through it. Those are my favorite working relationships when the communication is nice and open. And uh, everyone's willing to try ideas, and no one's really too um, too uh, attached to any idea either, you know. And you realize that, like, you know, this guitar riff is not me; <laughs> it's just a guitar riff. There's yeah, many more. Yeah, but also on the other hand, like um, getting like good reactions to something. Like if you have a good idea and then actually actually getting a proper good reaction it feels really good yeah and you can get really inspired by that as well yeah and that's i think one of the great things about working with other people is that energy feeds itself so when you get excited the other people get excited and then that makes you more excited and it just kind of grows and grows and in a lot of my favorite music i think you can almost hear that between the members the excitement yeah. that they all bring to it Mm. So, let me ask you the most annoying question musicians get asked, <laughs> and that's uh, how do you describe <laughs> your music? <laughs> yeah, I've been trying for a few years now, so I right. uh, should start to get a little hang of it, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, when we started, we just were trying out a lot of different ideas and genres and stuff. Um, but I think what the project boils down to is a combination of a lot of different influences um, and not really thinking so much about the like this genre rules and so on. Trying to, I guess, be somewhere in the middle or of um, like lots of inspiration from ambient music um, and club music 
and pop music and then some like uh, jazz and so on but i think that's the, the like the main three ones right yeah and you know those are like three of the things that i picked up about your music that i enjoyed quite a lot um you know for the pop angle there's catchy melodies you know um vocal hooks and things like that um but one thing that stuck out to me a lot and maybe this is like the ambient influence you're talking about is that it is uh it, there's a very like um atmospheric organic kind of vibe to what you're doing and um you know and I, I know um you you mentioned like you guys use a lot of field recordings in your in your work can you speak about that a little bit how that comes into play mm yeah it's uh, i agree it's absolutely from from all the work with um and influences of ambient music um and just uh i don't know there is so much interesting information uh, like we um auditory information in sounds you are recording um like i love synthesizers and all that as well but there is something very special about recording a sound and then filtering out something you don't need and then pitching it down two octaves and all of a sudden you can hear something you didn't really hear before mm. and then processing it with some plugins and you can just create some really unique instruments and it can go like um, when you're working with with the same tools a lot sometimes you can feel like you can get into yeah like you said like these patterns and then it doesn't feel so inspiring but when you're using some kind of audio material um as the sound source then it can kind of sound different every time right yeah i get that even um when I'm like, say I'm recording a guitar, for instance, say it's an acoustic guitar, um, even just if there's some sort of noise in the background that happens, or it might even be like the chair I'm sitting on squeaking. Um, sometimes that just like brings this life to the music that, you know, you're not going to get those types of little, I, I guess they're really like imperfections and problems technically. Uh, but you don't get those types of things like if you're, say, using like um, the operator inside of Ableton. It's a completely digital synthesizer. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I can also appreciate like really pure digital qualities. Mm -hmm. But I always find it really interesting when there are a bunch of layers in the music um, so that you can listen to it many times and discover new parts every time you listen to it. Um, I feel like working both with field recordings and also recordings of of acoustic instruments or making like sample based instruments, sampling one note or something and spreading it out on the keys and so on, can really help to create a lot of those layers. Mm. And actually, when I'm working with um, like pure digital instruments as well, I end up doing a lot of the same things. Like, for example, um, I've been playing, just playing the operator and putting it on like sine wave, just the first thing that comes up and you drag it in and then having um, a reverb and a delay after it and just playing something into the looper and then mm. pitching it down with the looper. So it's also like slowing down the reverb time or pitching it up it, like can create some of the sort of the same interesting things and also patterns you didn't think about playing. Hmm. Yeah, so you're capturing those reverb tails and delay tails too and, and now you're kind of repurposing them as you pitch them around and stretch them out. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, like after you have done one pass, like one loop, then putting it into overdub mode and changing the octave as you are playing. So uh. then... So then it becomes like, yeah, really weird rhythms and octave shifts in the middle of the loop. And since you don't really, it's not uh, easy to, uh, to like measure out, oh, if I pitch it down now, then everything slows down. But when I'm actually playing it back, it will be the opposite. So it creates some, some new patterns you wouldn't maybe think of in the first place. 
Yeah, that's a great idea. So you get that kind of um, the actual changing of the parameters gets printed into your loop that way. Yeah. And you get those yeah. kind of fun surprises. Yeah, and like I said, for example, the reverb, it sounds so different if it's being recorded one octave below or on one octave up. And when it's like changing in the middle of the loop, it can be really interesting. Right, right. Yeah, I find it fascinating when you start taking sound and you know, pitching it or stretching it to extreme, um, you know, to extreme measures, like not, not in the way like you're trying to make it fit in the bead and you're just kind of nudging it a little bit, but when you're kind of like abusing that and you're just messing with it, um, you can get some like really wild tones and textures out of those sounds. And one of my like early experiences with that was uh, I had this like old, like, cheap like Yamaha $100 keyboard that has like, uh, you know, 300 different sounds and they all sound like kind of cheesy uh, <laughs> elevator music type <laughs> of thing. But I took the drums and I just stretched them out as far as I could. And then I printed that and I stretched it again. And I just did that a number of times. And as the drums got stressed, stretched out so much, it stopped becoming a percussive sound. And it was all these like random musical notes. And I'm guessing that it's really just like noise that's making the drum sound. But when you pull it apart, you start to get all those randomized little pitches in there. And suddenly your yeah. drum is now some other weird magical instrument that never existed before. <laughs> yeah, I love to do stuff like that. Hmm. I actually did it on um, on the second track of the album, Feel Something. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, like the main hook... Uh, or the main uh, riff that comes in at the start is actually um, like a drum sample, that, like a distorted 808 or something, like kind of uh, modern cliche uh, trap uh, sounding uh, 808. Um, but then putting it into, um, into first I think I time stretch it uh, a lot just to get away from the percussive element, just like you described. Mm. And then bounce that down and put it into the simpler and then um it was already it was already tuned on a note i think or maybe i had to like correct the pitch a little bit but then just playing around with it and on purpose having warp turned off so that it would change the timing as you are playing higher and lower notes and just using that as like a rhythmical riff as well mm. and then yeah p processing a lot and putting a clean drum on top as well Right, to give it that, bring back the percussive element to it. Yeah. Ah, that's, that's a cool idea. And again, I think like you tap into like when you put things into samplers too, the way it gets stretched and pulled around can sometimes be really interesting. I've found... Yeah, absolutely. And just yeah, having the warp turned off so it's changing the time, as you said. Right. Because uh, like you really have to listen to and kind of like... I guess sneak around a little bit to make it actually work rhythmically as well. Like, uh, but if this note is a little late, then the time stretch works, so the ending will be really nice and all these kind of things. It makes you think in a different way. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, um, I do a lot of my own like sample-based instruments and you know, I've, I've put a ton of them online and yeah, I kind of uh, <laughs> laugh at myself sometimes because if I watch what I do on my little videos, uh, there's a lot of points in a lot of different videos where I start playing at the absolute highest octave, like C7, C8, where the sample just kind of breaks apart. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, it's looping, but it doesn't even sound like anything that it used to sound like. And it's just really crazy that y when you start really taking it to the limits of um, the stretching and the pitch, how all this other stuff just starts to kind of come out and like magically appears. And uh, there, there's some pretty tasteful sounds you can get that way. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you can get like, yeah. <laughs> Things you didn't really think about, or you couldn't have thought about before, almost. Yeah. Like there is one um, really cool example on the album as well, on the track uh, "Daeva," um, the fourth one, I think. Um, in the um, after like three minutes or something, there comes in a, 
like a synth kind of riff sounds almost a little bit like a chopped up marimba or something um and actually there i did just what you described like i played um like one of the piano presets like the super uh, lo-fi uh, trying to be like a clean piano sound that comes <laughs> in simpler or sampler or something um and just played it on like one of the really high octaves and then recorded it into um do you know the cvex lo-fi loop junkie pedal no it's that sounds fun if i, if I had <laughs> understood it right it's actually like an analog looper which i don't uh I don't really understand how that works because there is no tape or anything. But yeah, there is a long technical description on the website. But uh, it sounds uh, like a super lo-fi, really cool on uh, on guitars, and it wobbles and yeah, it sounds like a broken record. Um, what do you call that pedal? It's called uh, the brand is called Cvex, like uh, a set V E X, and then the pedal is called Lo-Fi Loop Junkie. Hmm. And they just made um, a one called Instant Lo-Fi something something as well, which is like a real-time effect of it. But this is a looper, so it records into into the pedal. Um, but it has a really limited frequency response, so it drops off after like, I'm not sure, like uh, 5K or 8K. There is just like a super steep roll-off. Right. So since the piano sound was so high in pitch was not getting like the kind of not getting the fundamental note was just getting uh. all the things around it and then uh, i used the um, mutable instrument clouds module yes to pitch it down again like two octaves or something or maybe even four i'm not sure um but at least yeah pitching it back down and like by the time it came back into the computer, it had been so destroyed that it sounded nothing like the original thing, but <laughs> really, really cool. Oh, that's a really cool workflow. So you're really manipulating like uh, the sample rates and playing around with like the limits of the gear. Yeah, absolutely. Find, but like, you don't think too much about it. Just like, yeah, work with the gear and experiment. Right. Yeah, and, th and that's fun because like you said earlier, it's you wind up in these places that you could never really plan to get to, but they wind up being exciting, you know, places to explore the sound. Yeah, absolutely. I think like there's something kind of funny that happens when you're playing around with audio, especially if it's beyond, like you said, like beyond the sample rate, even though there's nothing technically there, you can still kind of pull out all these like strange, I think of them almost like it, to me, it's like a ghost or something like a spirit <laughs> that like <laughs> yeah. exists like on, like it's in this world, but we can't see it kind of thing. And you, you start finding all this like odd stuff. Um, th these are usually the type of sessions where I just like kind of, I'm, you know, it's like four hours later and I'm just playing around with all these noises. Someone walks in the room like, what the <laughs> hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, and you just, huh? <laughs> You Have you also um, experimented with, with recording uh, like outside of the hearing range? Yeah, yeah, me too. That's really cool. Mm. Yeah, again, just, like, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I just um, last year I bought the the Zoom um, thing. It's called F4, like the bigger feed recorders they announced, mm -hmm. and that can sample in uh, 192 sample rate. So uh, this uh, summer I was just doing some hydrophone recordings at my uh, parents' place, and I did. We're just listening back to them, and then I said, like, to my father, like, "Oh, do you have a electrical device in the boat that's pumping out uh, water?" And he said, "Yeah, I have that, and uh, yeah, you can hear it here." And then he said, "Yeah, I also have this thing." Um, under the boat that's sending out ultrasound so the the plants and algaes won't attach to the boat and i was like what and then i oh. since there was so high sample rate, i just pitched it down like two or three octaves and then all of a sudden you can hear all these sounds that i hadn't heard before hmm. 
So they use a sound device to keep the algae off the boat. Is yeah, that, that's I what think it's say? the same concept as they do with the mosquitoes. They have, some people have stuff in their home that's sending out like high frequency noise. Oh, I did not know about that. But you know what? Um, I remember years ago, uh, my father bought um, this device that you'd plug into the wall. And it was like some sort of ultrasonic device that was supposed to keep like certain bugs and spiders out of the basement. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. That is wild. So they did. Yeah. This, I had no idea. You should uh, try to record it. Yeah, for sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it was, I guess, like a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know, two years ago, maybe where um, I think it was either NASA or the European Space Agency, I think it is, um, that put out the sound of the gravitational waves. Oh, wow. Do you remember this? Did you see this? I'm not sure. I've seen lots of different space things, and some of them, I think most of them are just uh, like... Um auditory representation of data but this was actually audio recordings yeah it was um they took whatever sound it was when they somehow you know i, I gotta read up on this again i i actually used the sample and i made my own instruments out of it but um th there is like some more complicated uh I'm, i know like i'm definitely going to say this wrong <laughs> but they basically <laughs> like took that sound and it was like I'm pretty sure it was a super low frequency um, and they wound up speeding it up so that we could hear what gravitational waves actually sound like. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And um, yeah, it was, but it's the same kind of concept where what we actually heard is, I'm pretty sure, much higher pitch than it actually was. Um, yeah, I, I could try to look it up, but I, I don't want to... <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. But that's a, that's a cool thing that... It just like makes you makes you think a little bit. Mm. Like I've been thinking, like if there were, um, if there ever would be like aliens landing on the Earth, and I had to explain. So what do you what do you use your life for? <laughs> it's like okay, we live on this planet, and we're just a little part of it, and I'm just making sounds that are <laughs> affecting us in this tiny range. It's. Yeah. <laughs> can be a bit humbling <laughs> yeah i'm making these like little noises that please us <laughs> yeah and and In you probably range. don't like they maybe don't do anything for you maybe you can just hear half of it or whatever yeah. well you know i've wondered about uh you know before we started recording i i put my dog upstairs right <laughs> so yeah. she wouldn't bark uh but i wonder a lot like you know what they are hearing when i'm doing some of my music um you know, because certain things they seem really sensitive to. And there mm. are like certain appliances in my house. As soon as they get plugged in, all of a sudden my dogs get all weird. Um, you know, we have like this coffee grinder. And as soon as that thing gets plugged in, she sits up and then she just starts barking like a lunatic. I usually let her outside. <laughs> and um, I think like drum cymbals, like those, like she seems especially sensitive to, um, you know wonder like when she hears the tv or the radio or the music coming out like does it even sound anything like what we're hearing or is she hearing these like upper frequencies that are just so far beyond our you know range of hearing yeah that's quite interesting i was at um artist talk um like a month ago and uh, they played back um a video like video art thing and i think it was from the 80s or something so probably from vhs or something and it had the worst uh, super high frequency note so loud so mm. much louder than the whole thing but the presenter was too old so he couldn't hear it oh so, <laughs> so he just <laughs> blasted it out right <laughs> i've had that experience um it's i'm a high school teacher <laughs> and uh, one of the ways the kids try to get away with using their phones in class is they'll have like, you know, this, maybe I don't see them do it too much anymore, but they'd have this like really high pitched ringtone that was supposed to be above like um, the hearing of anyone over say like 25 years old or something like that. So they'd have, the, all of a sudden you'd hear this like buzz go off 
and it's super high. You almost miss it if you're not paying attention, but you, as soon as you notice it, it's like the only thing you can hear. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some people just don't even hear it. Um, and I've seen that too, even with like uh, certain electronics, like televisions. Um, I was able, I have this, uh, Commodore 64 computer monitor, uh, you know, from the eighties or maybe yeah, yeah. earlier even. Still have yeah. it. It's got a great picture. Video games look so nice on it. <laughs> yeah, and it sounds cool. Yeah, it does have. I was been thinking actually to uh, sample it somehow, like run like synthesizers or something through it for like a lo-fi sound and have some fun that way. Um, but I can tell when that thing's on in the room, even if it's not, there's no picture on the screen. When it's when it's off and when it's on, if there's no signal going through, there's no video going through it, it doesn't look any different really. Like it doesn't glow, but I can hear it. And I'll like walk in the room and be like, what is that weird noise? And then I realize like we <laughs> forgot to turn the little TV off. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it makes you wonder like if I'm hearing that, like what are like, you know, your dogs hearing or, or those aliens you mentioned, they come down. It's, it's probably so much noise on earth now with all the different wavelengths we're putting out there, whether it's cell phones or FM radio <laughs> or who knows what. Yeah, I, absolutely. You wonder if uh, that's just like, it might be almost like impossible to be here for them <laughs> yeah have you um tried the electrostatic mics before i haven't i was going to bring that up though um i was looking for the link um these uh yeah tell me about it have you used those where they pick yeah. up like machine uh, noises right yeah they pick up when they're really close mm -hmm. and uh yeah it makes for a great sound source yeah, yeah i tried a few a few different of them um i have one that I bought from Jess Riley French. It uh, makes contact mics and hydrophones and so on. Mm. It's like a field recording artist. Um, and I've been using that for a few years. But just recently I tried this one from... Um, there is a company called Loom Audio or Lom or something. Um, and they make... They also make this really nice um, Omni like uh, really small microphones they are s that are so sensitive so you can record like really low atmospheres with them so great for that but they have this thing called I'm not sure how it's pronounced like electro sush or electro sush or something that's the one i'm thinking of yeah it's always sold yeah, out and that has <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> i've wanted uh, to I buy that actually try <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's always i just sold tried out. it the other day uh-huh uh because a friend of mine has it and it was so cool because it has a really nice preamp circuit as well. Mm. And it's picking up things that are a little bit in the the normal auditory range as well. Okay. So, and just, I just tried strumming an electric guitar and holding it over the strings and it sounded really cool. Oh, wow. But I did a concert with, uh, with my mic actually once, like a kind of a concept concert, which that was the only sound source. Um, and I figured out that if I would, like, it has a suction cup, and if I would stick it, like, exactly on the home button on my iPhone 4, um, that had a really great, like, rhythmical snap. I think it's, like, either it's turning the processor on or off, or it's checking if your finger is on the button or something. Um, but, like, if you just didn't do anything with the phone and let it sit for a while and put it on there, it was, like, tick, 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 tick. Really? Yeah, so I used that as a loop that uh, made a hi hat out of it, <laughs> and and then I figured out that I have uh, this um, the Monom 256. Have you seen this? I've seen it in your videos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've never got to use one, but I was going to ask you. I wrote that down to ask you a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, they're really great. But but anyways, like it has so many. Yeah, it has 256 lights, of course, because I have one for each button, and that just made a constant hum from probably like the USB power or something. Mm. But I figured out that if I would turn off the more um, like the more lights that were uh, on, it made a different note, probably because it's dragging more power. Mm. So I figured out like if I <laughs> turn on like zero lights, it makes this note. And if I turn on like 
a hundred lights and makes this note. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like playing melodies with wow. just turning on and off on the lights, which was a really like bizarre meta way of <laughs> using it. That's But really a lot of fun. funny. Yeah, so you're you're really uh, taking that instrument and <laughs> misusing and abusing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Oh, man, that makes me just wonder, like, you know, we were saying, like, just what is going on around us and what we're unaware of and what's, uh, you know, affecting us, who knows, in what kind of ways. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Uh, Have you done a, like a hearing test, just checked in live or something, how high you can hear? I've done it with, um, I had an iPhone app, which I don't remember what that was called, but it was this weird app where it would play you two notes. And um, I, I'm sorry, no, no. I'm mistaken. I it's I'm I'm about to go on a different story, <laughs> but uh, there was this web page that I don't think exists anymore. I had it as my homepage, but it was it was more like um, it wasn't necessarily a hearing test, but it was to sort of test uh, how well you can identify certain frequencies. Yeah, so, I've tried that. Do you know I what remember. I'm talking about? So yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. had like faders, and one would one would a note would ring out and you had to pick the right fader and lower the volume and there was i don't know how many there were maybe like 50 or 25 faders you could pick from um, yeah i'll try that but there were certain notes where i didn't hear anything <laughs> mm. yeah i tested myself with um the test oscillator in live mm -hmm. you know the one in preferences that you can use to check your audio outputs yeah. and so on yeah to make sure you're not clipping and stuff Or yeah. uh, running your CPU, I mean. Yeah, so, um, and I just tested that, and uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, depressing. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. My hearing stops at like fifteen point seven or something. Oh wow, okay. And I'm not that old. I'm twenty eight, so. Uh huh. But uh, now I'm always using earplugs and so on. So try to take care. Yeah, that's a really important thing. Um, I've been around tons of loud music in my life and I think um, I think my right ear is not quite as good as my left ear um, and I, I know exactly why it's because um, in the first band I was playing in w the way we would rehearse we in our little spots in our setup we were kind of like in like a semicircle and my right ear was always right next to the crash cymbal Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I was like in one of these bands where we wanted the drummer bashing the crash cymbal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We wanted the most maximum intensity possible. And uh, I think that, and I even know the exact cymbal too. I remember when my drummer got it. <laughs> But <laughs> I think like that might have done a number on my ear. It's not It's not terrible or anything, but I, I notice it a little bit that there's a slight difference. Yeah, but it's a little bit um, scary. I remember when I was younger as well. Like, I don't think anyone told me that like you should use earplugs because mm -hmm. it will destroy your hearing. Right. <laughs> I remember playing some some shows and the volume was so loud on stage that when the um, piano was piano player was playing um, some like high notes, I could hear them like being out of tune. But it was a sampled piano, so they were absolutely in tune. It was mm. just being like distorted through the loud volume. Wow. It was just too much. Yeah. Well, I, I imagine you've had that experience after a show laying in bed in complete silence, and then you just hear the ringing just yeah. I, going. It's been, it's, been a, it's been a while now, yeah. <laughs> luckily. Oh, I usually bring my uh, earplugs everywhere I go. Yeah, like I, using using uh, custom molded earplugs when you're out in a bar. That's like the best life hack ever. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's a good investment. I mean, it doesn't sound like a fun thing to spend maybe a hundred dollars on, but you know, that's your ears. You know? Yeah, and also like I found it so relaxing sometimes because. Uh -huh. Yeah, that too. The the more I've been working with sounds and the more I've been like really listening, the more overwhelming the whole uh, sounds of the world can be sometimes. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's just so, it's so loud <laughs> everywhere. And the blasting music at a bar or, yeah, 
just somewhere and also of course being around all this music all the time but still like in normal situations it can be so nice to just take it down by 15 db or yeah. 18 db right just like a volume knob on the world <laughs> yeah just smooth it out and people have to talk loud to go over the the noise anyway so you can still hear people yeah yeah that's true it's a good point i don't think it's stressed enough really you know it's it's one of those things you don't realize how important it is until it's gone mm. until you know until you start feeling the results of it a little bit yeah, and I mean, if you are depending your career on making sounds and even production and mixing, it's uh, yeah. a bit scary to, yeah, you have to check it a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I I mean, I think I've noticed it in, um, sometimes in uh, the older bands I've played with, for instance, I'll notice like the guitar tones they use are a little more trebly. And sometimes they almost hurt yeah. your ears. And I wonder if it's because they're not hearing it anymore. Yeah, I would think so. You know, they, they think it sounds good, but they're cranking the treble up because yeah. they don't hear treble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I oh, guess I had it's the... like mixing on a speaker system that doesn't get any bass, so you crank the bass up like crazy. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, I remember having um, quite a special experience um, like, yeah, a year ago or something um, I was uh, mixing an album for a band and I got sick so I just had a, um, like a ear in uh, no, not an ear infection but like you get a cold and then uh, then you can't hear anything on one right. of the ears yeah the sinuses because it's just clogged mm -hmm. yeah exactly um, so then I could only hear on one one ear <laughs> for like three weeks or something. Oh, wow. And I remember putting on a headset and listening to a podcast, and I know that the sound is panned in, in mono in the middle, but it sounded like it was on, yeah, maybe like halfway to the to the left. Mm. Um, and then also like the my hearing gradually and gradually coming back. And now I'm super sensitive to... Like, is this proper in the middle? Is the vocal really in the middle here? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, start overthinking it a little bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, if you can't trust your tools, you know, that's that's a bad feeling. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I teach um, some music production stuff um, at my school. And the, the speakers we have to play music back on are, I haven't tested them, but I don't think they're putting anything below like 80 hertz out of the speakers. It's just, it's just no low frequency response at all. And um, I had a student who was trying to get his, uh, he had like a bass sound and he was trying to get it to come through. He's like, I can't hear my bass. And I'm looking at his master fader and it is all the way up, you know, red <laughs> all the way. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And then what we finally did was we, we did have a pair of headphones and we plugged them in. And it's like, oh no, the bass is definitely there. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> you can't hear it on this speaker. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes if you listen to music on your laptop speakers, it sounds like if there's like some really low sub bass, it's like not even there. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, it's also so interesting how if you just distort that bass a little bit, so some of the yeah. overtones come out, right? Then you can like psychoacoustically, you can still hear it, even though it's not there. You're just hearing the overtones. Yeah, it kind of tricks your brain, and your brain's like, "Okay, I'll fill that in for you." <laughs> exactly. That's so interesting. I think. Hmm. Yeah, the mind, the auditory illusion that it produces, right? Yeah, and the same with. Um, the has effect where you're just delaying one side of the signal and then all of a sudden it feels like it's not in the middle it's out on the sides mm -hmm. it's yeah. also like really really interesting concept and so useful when you're mixing yeah you can get that like extra space that way yeah that's cool yeah it's that's it's really just the way our brain is perceiving things i guess right it's not yeah. a and I guess that's something to think about because I know like um, we've kind of evolved for our brains to be, you know, our ears to be sensitive to certain frequencies. And I, I've read some like theories on this and they think like um, maybe like uh, we've grown to 
be really sensitive to like the frequencies of like leaves rustling or sticks breaking, like as if a predator was creeping around in the jungle or something after us. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. We, we pick up on that, you know, really easily. And, you know, I know like that's always like kind of a troublesome area for me when I mix, like where sometimes I overdo those frequencies. I have to always be careful about that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> So um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, some of the, you know, we talked a little bit about the uh, sound design, uh, you know, field recordings and stuff, but I'm, I'm kind of excited about um, some of the things like you've been telling me that you use to do the music. Um, and one thing that kind of s jumped out at me was that you say you use a baritone guitar. Yeah. That's kind of rare around here. So how does that, tell me about the baritone guitar a little bit, because I've never played one. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, I have a electric Fender Jaguar baritone with humbuckers, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's tuned like uh, like uh, the normal guitar, just kind of one string below. So it start on the uh, the B, on then? A B. okay, mm -hmm. or H as we call it in Norway. H really? <laughs> yeah, oh, I didn't know that. That's crazy. <laughs> Oh, oh, interesting. Oh, it's I should it's say really crazy. funny. <laughs> no, I think cool. someone just mistyped it because uh, <laughs> lowercase b can look like a h if you're right. Doesn't <laughs> fill it in at the bottom. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, and yeah, it's it's also the one I have has a little bit shorter neck than usual baritone guitars. But what I found mm -hmm. really interesting is that since it's kind of between uh, guitar and bass. Like basses usually works really good just plugging directly into a DI or something. And I find a lot of the same qualities in the in this guitar. So it works really nicely with just plugging it directly in and using it live. Using it in live, I would say. Mm -hmm. Just processing and sampling and all this. So a lot of the synths in uh, all of our music are actually processed guitars. Really? That's cool. I got to listen to that with that in mind. Mm. Yeah, because there is like, a, you know, for me, I'm I'm originally an, a guitarist, so you know, I I relate to music best through guitar, and um, the expressiveness I can get in there. I'm always trying to find that, you know, digitally with synthesizers and stuff like that. So it'll be fun to kind of go back to your music. Some of the things that I think I'm hearing that might be synthesized are are actually guitar. Yeah, absolutely. And especially on the on the previous album, there is even more guitars. Mm. Oh, cool! Mm. I like that a lot. I'm always a fan of uh, combining the two. You know, the digital instruments, acoustic instruments, real world instruments. Yeah, and it's like I said, there is just so much information that just comes with it that you don't control. Yeah, which is really cool. Now I uh, have done a lot of gigs um, where I haven't brought the guitar because it's. It can be a bit too much to carry sometimes, mm -hmm. and especially if you're flying, then you have to have it in a flight case, and it becomes a hassle. So now I just sampled each note into into the <laughs> Critter and Guitar organelle I'm using. So at least like uh, a few of the sounds it still sounds exactly like my guitar, but uh, it's a bit limiting. But uh, it can be nice to at least have those tones available. Yeah, very cool. How do you like the the organelle? That, that is oh. such a cool looking instrument. I think they make that in Brooklyn too, don't they? The New York? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, well, so what do you think? It's funny I'm asking you as I'm about probably an hour away from the place. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah I really like it. Um, like it's, it brings so many other things that I like about computers, but mm -hmm. puts it into a format that doesn't feel like a computer. So, because it, as you probably know, and yeah, it runs pure data patches. So you can make of it whatever you want. It can be a synth, it can be a sampler, it can be a effect, it can be a looper, it can be whatever. Just make it whatever you want. And um, I just really like to have, since everything are like changing all the time and then you update some software and all this, it's nice to have like one stable instrument where you can mm -hmm. just like load up the same patches have the same sounds and just like okay I, at least i got that available in all projects every time since i have it in front of me right 
And yeah, I really like the keys, actually. Yeah, they're like wooden like buttons almost, right? Yeah, and it's uh, like uh, two octaves, kind of the same as the computer keyboard, mm -hmm. which uh, a lot of the songs have actually been made on the computer keyboard. Nice. Yeah, it, you know, it it um, just seems like a, an instrument that's sort of inspiring on its own, just by the way it works, um, its own sound, its own style. You know, there's nothing else really like it, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. At least it feels like something, and you can you can make it whatever you want. So it can also also grow with you. Right. So whatever you need, you can. You just need to take some time to program it, or maybe even someone else programmed something very similar. Hmm. And the community is really cool. I'm part of the forum there, and people are just really exploring this thing, like uh, uh, making new software that can run on it. Yeah, all the good things about computers, but in another format. Yeah, and that's nice. I mean, I think these days, like some of the the stuff that has that community behind it are some of the most interesting things because there's people just trying things out, experimenting, and uh, doing, taking like something like that well beyond the imagination of the people that even made it, like to all new levels. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be exciting. Yeah, and as I saw the there creators. was, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I saw there was one guy who just really started making a lot of patches for it. And now I'm pretty sure they hired him. Oh, yeah? Nice. So that's really cool. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. yeah it's, and that was um, uh, part of what um, something I like about inspired it. And me again, to I've go into the whole monom thing as well. Did it, yeah? Because yeah, that's, a, the that's same another kind of world. community. Yeah. And uh, what are you using that for in your performances? I'd actually like to talk to you a little bit about how you guys do live performance because you know there's a million and one ways to do live performance these days, and um, I w I'm watching some of your videos. Uh, there's a really cool one with you guys in the living room. I like that one a lot. Mm. Just kind of sitting across from each other. It looks like you're using the monome in that one, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. So how does it work for you? Because I know, th I mean, I've never used that one either, but. Uh, I know there's all kinds of ways you can put those things to use. Mm. It's a little bit uh, the same as the organelle. Like it doesn't, or at least the monom doesn't really do anything out of the box. You you have to decide what you want to use it for, which can be a bit of a learning curve. Um, but then, as I said, it can really grow with you. And uh, yeah, recently I've been really getting into making custom patches. So... You can like control whatever you want with it, and have different pages, and like yeah, fixing all my problems <laughs> while not having to get more gear. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, live performance. Uh, we've been through different stages, I guess. Um, started out like just purely like how can we perform this music in the first place, um, and yeah, I guess it helps that uh, part of my living is teaching um, live electronics and yeah, using live electronics as, as an instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been um, going through lots of different phases and right now we're actually kind of like breaking it down again and trying to get even more flexible. And um, the last few years, Vilda has really gotten into electronic music performance as well. So we're just trying to like yeah, work even more more connected and like um, really um, try to um, what do you say like yeah, d use the possibilities that are in the live format because um, you before we've we've had lots of improvisation and so on but it's usually been like how can we perform this album live mm -hmm. like the album is uh, but now we're diving more into like what can we do different from the album where we're on when we're on stage right yeah i go through this kind of funny back and forth with myself um with playing my electronic music live and um i mean not that long ago just the idea of even doing it was kind of weird like that you can do electronic music live but um, for me, when I started getting into it, I, you know, 
the first thing, of course, you can do is just press play and sing along or something or play one instrument along to a backing track, which, um, you know, for me was never really that exciting. Maybe if I was some sort of virtuoso at an instrument, it'd be interesting to watch, but I don't think it is otherwise. So it's like you have to kind of start taking away the automated things, but also make decisions on like what can still be like maybe predetermined loops or song structures. And I find myself constantly like at war, you know, really in my own head, I guess, where I'm trying to figure out like what is, you know, okay to like kind of let the computer do or let some piece of gear do and what should I be doing myself? Do you, do you run into that yeah, too? I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, as I said, like going through different phases, like we had one phase where, okay, we have to make all this really weird sounds that was originally made on a guitar, but then pitched down and all this, we have to do that live. But mm -hmm. then we couldn't do like the main elements live. So then we figured out, okay, we have to do like the main elements live and then the, all this, the weird stuff can go in the background. But then a lot of our music has like, um, like the actual chords and so on are just like pads. <laughs> so then it was just, okay, play this chord, play this chord, play this chord. <laughs> and then, so yeah, so we're constantly trying to take it one, one more level, I guess. Um, and, but yeah, that's one of the things I really like with live when you start mapping all the things manually, because then one button can do 10 things. So yep. you can like, okay, I'm going to play this part over here, but I need to start these five clips, which are my drums, so that mapped up to one button. So you can press one button and start that whole scene, for example. And just experimenting a lot with, okay, but then maybe take this loop, chop it into four different audio clips, where the fourth one also has like a send to the delay, so it kind of fades out a little bit. And then mm -hmm. you map it out, but then when you're starting to rehearse, you found out, hmm, it would actually be cool if I did this thing and this thing. So we constantly go back and forth between rehearsing and mapping and sampling out. And it takes a lot of time, but then when you are performing it, you're going to perform it lots of times, hopefully. So it's really cool to have a, a flexible system that you can actually like work with. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess that's like kind of where I wind up too. It's a lot of experimenting. <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I yeah, try to like plan it out. Priorities. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like it, there's nothing like actually just doing it right <laughs> to just testing yeah. it out. Yeah. And doing it over time, like playing a few shows this way and then figuring out, yeah, I remember uh, this song and this part felt a little bit stiff. So mm -hmm. What can we do there to... And then you, at another concert, you do something wrong. So, oh, but that was actually quite cool because you had to like very fast figure out what you're going to do to make the song actually continue working, <laughs> even though you pressed the wrong thing. So then you like really start working with it. And yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Maybe we should start incorporating those techniques into the live show and so on. Right. I, hey, I think that's a really important skill for the the live musician is to be able to think on your feet and, uh, you know, not be just totally lost. Cause I think it's pretty easy, you know, when you're doing, um, live electronic music and especially if you've got a lot of things kind of set up beforehand that are automatic, it's very easy to suddenly have something happen and then you're just totally lost. Yeah, absolutely. Or, oh no. I mean, at least if you have other musicians and you're all playing together, you can kind of look at each other and you know weasel your way back into the groove or something but sometimes like that like that clip just starts playing <laughs> and there's no <laughs> yeah. there's no taking it back <laughs> or it doesn't start playing <laughs> mm -hmm. i had a, a one of my worst experiences was um hitting the stop button you know on uh it was on my <laughs> apc 40 and uh yeah, yeah. If stop you all clips or stop the timeline stop everything <laughs> yeah stop the clock from ticking yeah and it's the way the old one was designed um the crossfader was either right above or right below the play record and stop button oh and, wow that's scary yeah and I, I mean i did a lot of shows before i realized how dangerous it was until one night I'm fooling around my crossfader and boom, 
everything's gone. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, uh oh. <laughs> like, what can I do but just laugh about it? And so then from there on out, I, I made sure I remapped those buttons to do something very, you know, inconsequential. I think uh, I changed it to just select a track. You know, it didn't even yeah, matter exactly. if I hit it. So it would, you wouldn't hear anything. But man, like uh, there's uh, when you're playing in like a live band, there's no button to, to just turn everybody off. I mean, unless the power goes <laughs> out, I guess. But yeah, and that's also one thing we um, worked a lot with, like actually triggering each part, even if there is like some loops that's just going to go on, just trigger them manually. And, um, and also we usually do it with no quantize mm -hmm. so that if you would have started something wrong you or you could like if it were a band you could like i just take a little kind of drum break here and now we're starting yeah now we're starting that uh, chorus or whatever right that's smart that gives you a little escape route i guess right <laughs> yeah absolutely like mm. it would be in another band you could just look at each other and like three, four, there we start. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, that's those are good things to plan for. And I think you don't always realize those vulnerabilities until they happen. Until, mm. you know, through playing enough, you realize, uh oh, that's a dangerous problem right there. <laughs> and I think also that's um, something people should uh, incorporate into their rehearsal routine. Not necessarily just like Oh, what happens if I mess up? But like, okay, so now we know the song. What are all the things I can do that I that I, we didn't necessarily plan that I would do? So that if something happens, you know that it, like, okay, so if I press that button, then this thing happens. Yeah. Right, so you kind of plan for that and so you can improvise around it. Yeah, it's a little bit like just, making it part making it your instrument and rehearsing like yes imagine a traditional traditional musician just playing a piano and the keys disappearing <laughs> like uh, <laughs> oh you know i started this melody now can't play this note <laughs> yeah where'd that key go <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it's true though but a good musician will figure out a way to get around it yeah exactly yeah and no, that's actually like how I think of my setup, it's, it's an instrument, you know, it's not just like, um, I think when I first went into it, I thought like, you know, once I have it set up, I'll just be able to play my songs. But it's pretty soon after I realized there's actually technique to this, you know, it might not be, uh, an, an actual piano or guitar, but you know, it is its own instrument that needs to be learned and understood and practiced. Yeah. And what's even more with, this instrument is that you choose so much of how the instrument is going to be yourself. Yes. So you have to make your own systems and all this. So I think it's a really good practice to just, okay, I usually have this button doing this thing. So you open up uh, another project that uh, it's a pretty good uh, percentage that that button is going to do that thing. Right. Now, when you guys play, are you able to go independent of each other or are you guys tied in together? Like, do you work off the same computer or is it two separate ones? How does that work? Yeah, we use the same computer, um, but we have different controllers and try to set up everything so that um, yeah, it's not like clashing too much. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think like if you turn off all the auto features in live then you can be really free even with more people right yeah okay so like you can one person can go on if the other one has to for whatever reason recover or <laughs> fix something yeah, except of course if the computer crashes yeah there's always that danger right yeah <laughs> <laughs> any horror stories with that <laughs> um yeah, I guess I have a few. Like, I remember there was, it was not with Scroll, it was a solo concert, but I remember having um, hard drive problems with my mm. old MacBook Pro. And for some weird reason, like <laughs> turning on the granulator would may would often be the thing that crashed it, like different oh, yeah. projects and so on. And I remember like it was a really small gig. 
Uh, and I just okay, I need the granulator now. <laughs> Turned yeah. off and went all silent. Oh no! Like uh, <laughs> live was showing sound out and everything. So I had to change. Uh, yeah, I changed to an SSD, and then it was like a brand new computer. <laughs> yeah. But also, I remember one gig was grow where um, we had had an effect track on the on the master track. Right. Because at s- on some concert, not sure why, may- but um, at one part we were gonna kind of like just float out. So we had the dry chain, and then we had a chain with a reverb and a low pass filter and a delay and so on, just kind of going into a little dream world and then go back. Uh, so I had a fader for each of those two chains. And uh, I forgot about it, so this is I didn't use it for for a lot of gigs. But then I had one gig, um, and I had that mapped to two physical faders on a MIDI controller. So, and uh, I had turned off pickup mode. I don't like the pickup mode, actually. I like to turn the fader and then the value goes there. Um, but we loaded the project and everything was fine. <laughs> and then at one point, there was so much bass that the fader just moved a little bit. So then the value jumped. Uh. So it was, <laughs> so the volume just dropped by like 15 dB, just like really low. And I was like, what's going on? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> but that was uh, like a user mistake. So that's uh, yeah. on my part. <laughs> well, there's a lot, like you said, you're designing your own instrument, right? And you're mapping it and you're making all those decisions. So there's a lot of places where things can get funny. Yeah, I've definitely had the experience where something happens and I'm like, what is doing that? Why am I not hearing it? Or why am I hearing it? <laughs> and sometimes you just got to start turning knobs and moving faders until you realize. I have a habit of um, when I'm done with a performance, a lot of times I'll do like a, a low pass filter until it kind of fades away into nothing. And then I'll I'll save my session. <laughs> yeah, and the exactly. next time I open it up, it's like, why? I can't hear anything. And I scratch my head for like five mm. minutes trying to figure out why no sound is coming out. And it's just the one stupid filters all closed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I actually just spent lots of the part of the day today um, like troubleshooting because I just got a new sound card. Mm-hmm. I got the, I have the small UAD Apollo twin from before, and I just uh, bought one of those rack things as well. Nice. Um, and you can connect them together and use all the ins and outs on both of them at the same time and all this. Really a cool, nice system. But for some reason, like <laughs> when you're then just using one of them, <laughs> they, like, yeah, I had to figure out a lot of things. I ended up, because uh, you can make like custom, okay this output goes here and this output goes there and so on and then it just like did some of the outs didn't work and yeah. i had to go back to the default setup now it seems to be working but a little bit complex to figure out everything well i i can't tell you how much time i've spent where i thought i was going to be making music and i'm just trying to figure out why things are not connecting properly or they're not communicating i'm turning things on unplugging plugging back in <laughs> mm. i think yeah, it's- at one point if like okay now i know these things i've been doing this for so many years now i know all of this but then something changes there is an update and now yeah. it's completely different mm-hmm yeah, just like that. It's like you're saying with the Qatari, the organelle. Um, it's it's its own thing. <laughs> it doesn't care if yeah, you exactly. updated the OS or whatever. <laughs> I would love if Ableton would make like a the live box, which was just the the like a yeah like the MPC live, just a small computer inside, but just running Ableton live and just being super stable and yeah. being not something you would go online for. Right. <laughs> That would be nice, but we get so greedy for updates <laughs> so often, right? Yeah, that's true. You know? But then at least it would be a closed system, so then yeah. they could just work on that. Well, you're seeing a lot of that um, these days um, where you know, for a long time everything was moving to the computer, and now we're starting to see more interest again in like these kind of standalone things. They kind of mm. just work alone, you know, whether it's like maybe like the Electron stuff or even like the... Korg Volkas and like you said, the MPC live becomes its own little thing. Interesting where that's going, where the laptop is like 
um, sometimes you're not seeing it as much anymore. Oh, you jumped out there for a second. I got uh, until uh, the NPC live. Well, just I think mostly I was just thinking of what to say, <laughs> but uh, that the laptop <laughs> is sometimes not, you know, I'm seeing more people doing performances without the laptop at all. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see. I think we're going to move into some sort of like post uh, computer world. <laughs> yeah. For music and for myself as well, like. Uh, during a performance, I don't look at the don't look at the laptop where we're playing. It's just set on the side, being the the brain of the whole system. Mm. So it would be nice to have like a nice sturdy box that I wouldn't be so afraid of breaking. Right? Yeah, that your internet is gonna ruin it or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or just that, like, uh, oh, it's so small because people want to carry it back and forth to school, so the it can maybe overheat in some certain situations or, mm -hmm. yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I think you might be right that we might start seeing. I think we're seeing a little bit of it anyway. Whether or not we'll get completely away from the computer, I don't know. But I think there is definitely a movement of people that are kind of saying, no, I'm going to do this without the computer, outside the box. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you see, that's, I think, uh, one of the reasons why you see the Eurorack community is just really taking off now as well. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, and that's huge. And that is a place I have not yet gone because uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll ever be able to afford that. <laughs> <laughs> just no, I know what you mean. Uh, that's just a whole nother. I know what I'm getting myself into if I go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of debt. <laughs> yeah, but definitely some cool stuff. You use the cloud, um, the mutable cloud, right? Yeah, I just um, bought uh, like the smallest Dopfer case that cannot house almost any module, uh -huh. and I bought the uh, the clouds and. Uh, yeah, a couple of more just utility ones. Um, and then I have a um, dope for dark energy, the standalone yeah. desktop synth. And that has a lot of the things that has, like media to CV, and it has a filter and also later and envelope out and all this. So it's been really cool to work it. As you probably guessed already, I love like granular stuff and pitch shifters and delays and all this. So it's mm -hmm. a really cool module to work with. And that seems smart to buy something that you can fill up fast. Yeah. It's like a nice case. Because I, I think if you buy something big, you're going to look at those empty spaces all the time and be like, what could I put in there? <laughs> yeah. What and also I really like to buy stuff that you can actually manage to carry it and use on a gig as well. Yes. Well, that informs a lot of my decision on what I bring to a gig. I like to be able to carry everything in one shot so it can fit on my backpack and maybe another bag and in, and in my hands. And I can you know, not have to make multiple trips back to a car or something. Yeah, absolutely. I think and that, that has been uh, also one of the inspirations why I've been getting into programming lately. Because um, when you can make your own Mux patches, then you can create banks on all your MIDI controllers that doesn't have banks in the first place. Oh, nice. So like I have this Fader Fox controller, for example, the, it's, mm. I think it's called a P PC4, just uh, 24 uh, non-endless uh, uh, knobs. Um, and yeah, so it's just 24 knobs that goes from 0 to 127. But now I just made a small patch that gives me 250 knobs. That's pretty cool. And that you've expanded that on your own. Yeah, exactly. And then um, I'm using a, a small Arduino just uh, with a tiny little screen. Looks like a, kind of like a soda machine screen or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and that just tells me which bank I'm on. And if I turn a parameter, it says this one is mapped to the filter cutoff and they're at this value. Or if I'm changing the bank, it says the last time you turned this knob, it was at this place. So I have to go there before it starts working and yeah, just giving me the information that I need. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so just enough. And and like maybe that's a, a cool, um, you know, post computer direction to go where you, you just get the information you need yeah, instead exactly. of the whole screen of all kinds of bells and whistles. 
I think. And I find it much easier to focus as well, just listening and just getting, as you said, the information you need and not getting sucked into, Yeah, everyone knows how you can get really sucked into the big, nice screen on the MacBook Pro. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I really love when I can kind of get away from that. I, my OP1, Teenage Engineering OP1, is... I love it for that reason because it's about as like big as your field of vision when you're leaning over it. <laughs> so it just occupies like your space. You just right there, and you just like get sucked into that thing. Yeah, and yeah, that looks really cool. It, it's it's one of my favorite things I own, pieces of gear wise. Honestly, um, I've had so much fun using it in so many different ways. From you know just as a synth, a drum machine, making little songs on there. But even I, I um, plug a microphone into it and then just use it as a four-track recorder. I did a little EP of songs that I just recorded. They're like punk rock songs. Um, no synths or anything, just guitar, bass, and drums and vocals. And it's all just plugged, a uh, Shure SM57, just plugged right into the microphone jack and just record right onto that little four-track. I love it. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, I really liked that episode. Oh, cool. Thanks. That was, um, it was just one of those things like it was so fun and productive to do music that way because I, I've got my headphones plugged in, I got the microphone plugged in, and then I'm just carrying the thing around the room from instrument to instrument. There's no electrical wire and it's, it's the same microphone for everything. It was great. I mean, talk about like just working quick and speedy. Uh, it, It yeah, exactly. Was, you just it, get stuff done. Yeah, it reminded me of the old days when I was a kid with like a four-track tape recorder, and you know, there's just nothing else to do but record whatever you can get on a microphone, and no processing, you know, no uh, setup. Really, it was really fun way to work. Yeah, that's so cool, and I can uh, actually feel a little bit of the same with the computer sometimes. Like, I rig up all this stuff and just oh now I'm gonna do something but then when you're done it was like you have lost all the creative energy so then you just uh, disconnect the computer and go sit in the couch and uh, watch a video with the with your headset on and then like hmm yeah maybe I just open live and just I remember I have some some cool samples from uh, some concert I did and you just import them and then you get really inspired and Like, oh, there was two hours and I have a finished song almost. Mm -hmm. When you're just using the computer and no, no like technical setup -y things. Yeah, right. You're just in there. Yeah, because it's very easy to hook everything up and then have 72 different things you could play with. And you kind of like fiddle with one thing for a few minutes and then the other and you don't really get anywhere. Hmm. <laughs> And I love that you can use the computer keyboard as a as a MIDI keyboard as well. Yeah. And it's so restricted, so you end up finding these really creative like uh, patterns and like uh -huh. chord uh, shapes. Yeah. So a lot of the songs I'm writing are actually based on what notes I can play on that keyboard. That's cool. And then you cool. can just uh, change key with the uh, with the pitch uh, plugin or transposing stuff. Right. Yeah, but you are you're stuck right there. And again, I think limiting your choices is actually what we need to do these days to get work done. We have so many places we can go. So when you cut things down, you make decisions and you get creative. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> and not trying to like learn everything at the same time, but just getting some tools and like learning to be really creative with them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something I've learned um, probably too late because I spent too much money buying things. <laughs> But the, <laughs> the idea that like you're really better off understanding how to use something and having just a couple things you know inside and out than you are just collecting things that you, you don't even know how to use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, listen, um, I think we're getting near the end of the time here. Um, mm -hmm. Really nice to talk to you. Uh, lots of cool stuff that yeah, you leave same, me man. feeling very inspired to make music. <laughs> And to me, oh, that's, that's like cool. uh, one of the best things, you know. I'm excited yeah, to uh, play around with this whole idea of uh, the the uh, sounds outside of our hearing that we were talking about earlier. Um, 
playing around with like those like kind of imperfections, those noises, even you got me thinking about like, even just like, um, when you plug in your instrument, your guitar or something, and just some of the noise you get from maybe the amp or the things that, um, you're not really supposed to like, I'm going to try to find a way to make use of. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. So thanks for that. That's, that's a cool uh, place for me to go from this conversation. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Sam, it's uh, a lot of the things I'm getting when I'm listening to all your episodes as well. Both the things you are explaining and interviews with other people and yeah, just the sharing both like concrete techniques, but also just hearing people talking about something they're really passionate about. Mm. I really creating an inspirational setting. Oh, good. Yeah, I think... Uh that's that's where I find my most interest in all this stuff is somewhere between the practical and the philosophical <laughs> that um, you know the, obviously the practical things are, are great because you can use them right away but I think some of the philosophical things that come up in these talks apply to everything you could really do any endeavor whether it's making music or I don't even know um, getting yourself in shape or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, it, it translates to a lot of different things and it's really fun to hear everyone's different perspectives on that kind of stuff. Mm. Hmm. Cool. Is there any place you would like to direct people to check you guys out, your work, Scro's work, um, anything you want to send people yeah. off with? Um, I guess, uh, yeah, so our, we have a new album out, as said. Uh, it's on all the normal digital platforms, um, on Spotify and SoundCloud and wherever. wherever. Um, and if you want to follow Scroll, we are um, pretty good at updating our Facebook. Hmm. You can just search for Scroll there, or it's facebook.com slash scroll music. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, you can also go to my website, which is kristofferlislegård.com. And uh, to spell that out, that's uh, K-R-I-S-T-O-F-F-E-R for Christopher. And L-I-S-L-E-G-A-A-R-D, Lislegård. Um, so I guess this, that's two good places. And also I've just uh, been starting doing uh, live streaming. I'm doing this these improvised ambient live streams on oh, YouTube. Cool. So you can go on uh, the very creative uh, name uh, Christopher1989 <laughs> on uh, YouTube.com uh, or just search search for my name, Christopher Listiger, on there. Um, yeah, so I guess that's... And also we have a YouTube for Scroll which where we're posting live videos and music videos and so on. But um, yeah, so I guess that's the main places. And Very as good. you said, scroll is easy to Google, and the same is uh, Christopher Lislegård. So, yeah, yeah, and scroll is spelled S G R O W, like the word grow with an S in front of it. Yeah, exactly. That's how we came up with the name. By <laughs> by moving that S around. Is it- yeah, we were working on a we were working on a track, and we just had like one bar loop or something, and uh, the vocals were singing like blah 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 is growing and so on. And with the, just the one bar, we were just uh, hearing like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling over and over again. So I guess technically the name is a sample of our first song. That's really funny. Isn't that weird how <laughs> when you start looping things and playing around, how new things come out? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it. That's so cool. Well, yeah, Chris, but, um, thanks I'm man so- for uh, letting me participate. It was uh, really nice. Yeah, yeah, I'm really glad we got a chance to talk and I'm getting a chance to dive into some of your music and learn from some of your techniques. I, again, I really enjoyed the the album. Um, so many cool sounds and good melodies. Like it scratches my itch in a lot of places, you know. It's got the melody, it's got the cool uh, sounds and uh, it's just quality in a lot of ways and I don't always find it, you know, hitting on all those different levels. So I, I'm really happy with it. It's been really fascinating music to listen to. A lot of like stuff that makes you wonder like, wow, how'd they do that? Where's that sound? And then, oh, that's a really nice melody and the cool chord progressions. So I, I'm liking it quite a bit. Oh, so thanks, thank man. You. I really appreciate that. 
Cool. Well, thanks, Christopher. Really good talking to you. And yeah, thanks the same. And thanks everyone that listened. Please check out his work. Lots of really cool stuff. And uh, we will see you soon next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>